Y'all probably wondering how I got to be up here today. Um, Amen. <laughs> not my regular milieu. Well, everybody who's qualified was going to be busy somewhere else. And uh, the most qualified have a lot of duties right here. And so it's kind of like the story of when the congregation had a really bad problem. They didn't know what to do, and the elders were just posing over it. And finally, one of the elders said, let's pray about it. And they said, oh, no, has it come to that? <laughs> so this kind of rabbi's dilemma, and here I am. Is anyone else nervous? No. Oh, good, good, good. Well, I'll be teaching a lesson today. I know for some of you that means that uh, lesson, this is pretty interesting. I'm going to take me a nap. So if that's what comes upon you, you can watch it on video later. I'm going to start out, and, and Leonardo aptly brought that out about Rabbi. Um, reminds me of a story about... Um, is related by Cicero, who's an orator in the fourth century before the common era. era. And stories about a man named Damocles, who was a sort of Damocles. And he was a courtier in the court of Dionysus II of Syracuse on the island of Sicily. Cicero was a really interesting man. He was born tongue-tied and became a famous orator. So I guess you can't overcome things. Cicero, as the story goes, went down to the shore and picked pebbles that had been washed smooth and put them in his mouth and practiced speaking so that he could enunciate even with a mouthful of rocks. And he overcame his tongue tightness by that. There's a famous saying, well, it might not be famous to everybody, but it's one of the quotes of the world. I prefer, prefer tongue tight knowledge to ignorant loquacity. Mm -hmm. Well, there we are. <laughs> There's the rabbit going down the trail, and here I am on it, and you're with me. Okay. Well, anyway, Dionysus II had this guy, courtier, and you know, courtiers always seem to develop this urge to be the guy on the throne. Well, Damocles had a really bad case of it. So Dionysus II says, okay, I'm going to have you sit on my throne. And oh, good, says Damocles. The problem was Dionysus II, to bring him to a lesson, took a very huge, heavy sword, tied a horse hair from the tail of the horse on it, hung it up above Damocles. So he sat in the throne, but up above his head is this sword. And so we get the story of the sword of Damocles because you keep looking up, thinking, well, it's pretty nice in this throne, but there's a lot of things that could happen. It's kind of like Rabbi's position sitting in the sword of Dan sword on the throne of Damocles because there's all sorts of flack that happens in life. And... Uh, so, that's why I'm here today. Thanks, Rabbi. <laughs> <clears throat> about the story about your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, this morning I'll be teaching about the power of unity with our brothers and sisters. And one major detriment that our adversary so successfully uses against us, it's the detriment, it's, it's a word called offense. Now it's a paradoxical thing because here I'm going to talk about offense and certainly people who are easily offended are going to be taken offense. And that's why I thought about the sword of Damocles. There's a high probability that that hair is going to break today. 
And you won't see me looking up too often because I didn't want to see it. The thing is that when we have a message from our Father, and it's a message that's a message of help, it's uh, something that was pointed out in the sayings of our fathers, for Kevot, and there's a Rabbi Tarfan who talked about our job of repairing the world, and he, he said, it is not incumbent upon you to finish the task but neither are you free to absolve yourself from it. So that which is before you is yours to do. Uh, it's like Louis Moore with the Cowboys. If there's a job to do, it's yours to do, and you can't quit till it's done. I don't care if it's cold. I don't care if it's raining. Just get out there and do it. And so today, I'm going to do my best. To quote. Now, there are more challenges. You see in James chapter 3, says, not many of you should become teachers serving in an official teaching capacity. My brothers and sisters, for you know that we who are teachers will be judged by a higher standard because we have assumed greater accountability and more condemnation if we teach incorrectly. Well, then we've got Paul's instruction to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study. And do your best to present yourself to God approved, a workman, tested by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. But avoid all irrelevant babble and godless chatter, which is profane, empty words, or it will lead to further ungodliness. So it's the question that I have, and why I haven't slept for a while. It's... Am I doing my best? And again, from the sayings of our fathers, it's Rabbi Judah and Perky of Vote 413, study with care, for error in the course of study is accounted as deliberate sin. So it's not just uh, let's have a good time, it's not something that once you go up to the Lord and say, pick me, pick me. But there's a blessing in bringing the word to the Lord. There's a story in 2 Samuel, and we touched on part of 2 Samuel today, and it's about what happened with, or, or last night, it's about Absalom, the son of David who Joab killed. And there's a man, now Ahimaaz, son of Zadok, said, let me run and take the news to the king that the Lord has vindicated him by delivering him from the hand of his enemies. You are not the one to take the news today, Joab told him. You may take the news another time, but you must not do so today because the king's son is dead. Then Ahimaaz called out to the king, All is well. This is Later on, he, make, he makes the run. Joab had sent a runner, a Kushite, and Ahimaaz ran faster than him, came up to David. This is chapter 18, verse starts at 19, and this is way down to 28. It says, all is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, Praise be to the Lord our God. He has delivered up those who lifted their hands against my lord the king. These were the people who were following Absalom. And the king asked him this question, because this was his instruction to Joab and the generals when they went out. Is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz answered, I saw a great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant in me your servant, but I don't know what it was. Uh -huh. uh, Himaz, he wanted just to bring a sweet message to defeat the king. He wanted to be the bearer of good news. Hey, your enemy's defeated. But when asked the direct question, he just lied outright to defeat. He brought a message that wasn't respecting his audience at all. So, I want to bring a message that's an uplifting, encouraging message to you today, but I'm, I'm not going to tickle your ears. But like Hebrews 
and let us keep paying attention to one another in order to spur each other on to love and good deeds. You know, several weeks ago, a rabbi spoke about the glory of God, the Shekinah, uh, the, his manifest presence, and how it would be lovely for us to have the manifest presence of God here in our midst, and that we would be in its midst. Psalm 1611 says, You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Well, in order to understand this correctly, let's take a look at like the logic of a snowflake. We say that if an object is a snowflake, it will melt when it gets hot. You can understand that. Well, If, when it gets hot, it doesn't melt, it's not a snowflake, because we know if it's a snowflake. So we know that if we are in his presence, we will have fullness of joy. And then if we don't have fullness of joy, we not, are not in his presence. Well, today let's walk along the road together toward the fullness of joy. I'd like that. And the manifest presence of God. Let's hide in the shadow of his wings, receiving healing and pleasures forevermore from his right hand. And a good beginning for us, and if you want to turn there, you can. I've got this to read. It's John 15, verses 9 through 13. And there we start out, just as my Father has loved me, I too have loved you, so stay in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will stay in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and stay in his love. I have said this to you so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. Well, there's a clue, isn't there? This is my command that you keep on loving each other, just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than a person who lays down his life for our friends. Similarly, in Romans chapter 12, I'll just read this. If you want to go there, you can. This is verses 9 through 21. Don't let love be merely an outward show. Recoil from what is evil and cling to what is good. Love each other devotedly and with brotherly love. And so examples for each other in showing respect. Don't be lazy when hard work is needed, but serve the Lord with spiritual fervor. Rejoice in your hope, be patient in your troubles, and continue steadfastly in prayer. Share what you have with God's people and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them, don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be sensitive to each other's needs. Don't think yourselves better than others, but make humble people your friends. Don't be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but try to do what everyone regards as good. If possible, and to the extent that it depends on you, Live in peace with all people. Never seek revenge, my friends. Instead, we vent to God's anger, for in the Tanakh it is written, Adonai says, vengeance is, vengeance is my responsibility. I will repay. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap fiery coals of flame upon his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. The strong anointing of unity, the most famous psalm for that, Psalm 133. Who knows the start of that? How blessed it is when brothers live together, dwell together in unity. It's like the fragrant oil on the head that runs down over the beard, over the beard of Aharon. 
and it flows down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon that settles on the mountains of Zion, for there it was that Adonai ordained the blessing of everlasting life. And this is big imagery of the anointing of the Spirit of the living God being upon us. Comes from, and Angela brought that up in her prayer, dwelling together in unity. May we be in unity with each other. Of course, no, we're on this road, and we want to be on the road to unity. But guess what? Roads booby trapped. Don't like it. Booby traps are no fun. They explode and they hurt people, kill people, and all this kind of stuff. We're in that road, and we're going to be wounded along the way. <coughs> Yeshua raised a warning flag for us about this in Matthew 24 and verse 10. He talked about our day and about is being Scandalized, the Greek word that's used in there in Matthew 24, 10, it says, And then shall many be scandalized, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. The word is scandalizo, so it's pretty easily seen that that word is scandalized. Some translations are a little different. That one was from uh, actually from a Dewey Rims 1899 version of the Bible. Uh, King James Version says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. That spirit of offense, it's pernicious, and it's like, okay, something happened bad. Oh, I'm so scandalized. It's like, yeah, right, like, you never did anything. But that's where we are. We get scandalized. We're, we are offended and put our offense and raise our offense above everything else. There's a spirit of offense and sometimes it's a little mild. It's kind of like, you know, the story about the, the young Jewish man who got two sweaters from his aunt and his aunt was coming to visit so he had to pick one to put it on. So I know I have to wear a sweater for auntie so he picked one, put the sweater on and the aunt comes and sees him and looks at him and says, so what was wrong with the other sweater? It, that spirit of offense, it can overtake people. And the, the Stanley brought this up in his Beit Midrash about Protestant or Protestant. Well, we have Martin Luther who was Protestant. Martin Luther had a spirit of offense about him, evidently. Uh, Martin Luther was so enthralled and loved the Jewish people so much that he made a big evangelical writing and encouragement to them to come into the same belief as he, and it didn't happen. And he got offended and he didn't forgive. What he had anticipated didn't happen. He held it tightly against him and as a result of that, what did Martin Luther do? Publish the famous manuscript, the Jews in their lives, and recommended all of the things that Hitler used to justify the Holocaust, because Martin Luther was offended and he couldn't let it go. And we need to watch out the Messianic movement, because we carry, oftentimes with us, a protestant heart. We've come to where we are because we've protested in our own thoughts and minds about the place we left. Some of us came from one spot and some another. Some of us came from not believing in anything. But if we've come with a protestant heart, then one thing that's very big for us that we need to do and always remember is that we need to forgive the people we protested against if they had wronged us and even so make a place for them in our heart. Because they aren't the same as us, but guess what? You know the people that we've come from? Largely most of us have come from a group that believed in Yeshua. They still believe in Yeshua and God still looks favorably upon them. And their ways are different than our ways. They're not our enemy. Amen. 
and they need our forgiveness in, if we can ever do something good for them and kind for them and lead them and show them who Yeshua is in the best fullness possible, that's the biggest thing we can do, pray for them that God will bless them. You know, if we pray real hard for an enemy, we just, what's the, what's the best blessing that there is in the entire world? Isn't that relationship with Hashem? Well, if we ask our Father to bless our enemies with the very biggest blessing possible, they're going to come to Him and then they aren't going to be our enemies anymore. I mean, it's a really <laughs> bad situation. Amen. So, you know, everybody takes offense. All of you take offense. I take offense. The issue is, when you take it, Put it back down. Get rid of the offense. Don't let that offense develop a bitter root. We're going to get to the Torah portion now. Genesis 49. And I'll be touching on some of the blessings of Jacob's children. And the children that we're going to be looking at are uh, starting with Reuben. We're going to look at uh, Simeon and Levi and Gad. And I'll be quoting some things from the uh, Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. This uh, fragments from that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, at Qumran, not in the scrolls, but they were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's really ancient. The blessings that Yaakov gave to his sons. Gather yourselves, therefore, this is Genesis 49, Starting at verse 1, gather yourselves together and I will tell you what will happen to you in the Akharit Um Assemble yourselves and listen, sons of Yaakov, pay attention to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my strength, the first fruits of my manhood. Though superior in vigor and power, you are unstable as water. So your superiority will end because you climbed into your father's bed and defiled it. He climbed into my concubine's couch. Shimon and Levi are brothers related by weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let my honor not be connected with their people. For in their anger they killed men, and at their whim they maimed cattle. Cursed be their anger. For it has been fierce, their fury, for it has been cruel. I will divide them in Yaakov and scatter them in Israel. And we get down to Gad. Not so bad. His, his uh, blessing is Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Somehow, Reuben and Shimon and Levi took this harsh blessing. It's like if you were number four coming behind them and you're, you're Yehuda who's done all these things, some good, some bad, it's like you're not anxious to be the next coming through that gate to that tent. You're saying, oh good gracious, you know, what's going to happen here? But that's uh, someone else's tale. Well, what did they do to get rid of this offense? Because we know that Israel lived in harmony with the brothers for all this time till they left Egypt and then moved into the country and, and supported and fought and did all these things. How did they handle this offense that they could even go on? Well, according to the testament of the patriarchs, this is a little snippet from Reuben's deathbed testimony. Hear my brethren, and do ye my children, give ear to Reuben your father, and the commandments which I give you. Behold, I call to witness against you this day, the God of heaven, that ye walk not in the sins of youth and fornication, wherein I was poured out, and defiled the bed of my father Jacob. And I tell you that he smote me with a sore plague in my loins for seven months, and had not my father Jacob prayed for me, the Lord would have destroyed me. Reuben came to his senses. He said, don't do this. He was able to give a lesson to his sons 
don't do this. For I was 30 years old and nine when I wrought the evil thing before the Lord, and for seven months I was sick unto death. And after this, I repented and set purpose of my soul for seven years before the Lord. And wine and strong drink I drank not, and flesh entered not into my mouth, and I eat no pleasant food, but I mourned over my sin, for it was great, such as had not been in Israel. And Reuben put his offense to death. Shimon, his testimony. In the time of my youth, I was jealous in many things of Yosef, because my father loved him beyond all, and I set my mind against him to destroy him, because the prince of deceit sent forth the spirit of jealousy and blinded my mind so that I regarded him not as a brother. So here we have Yosef and how this burned in his heart and later on in Shimon's testimony. This is available by the way as a PDF online, you know, the testimony of the 12 patriarchs. I'd really recommend reading it. But Shimon, killed his offense. Levi, he says, I slew Shechem first, and Simeon slew Hamor, and after this my brothers came and smote that city with the edge of the sword. My father heard these things and was wroth, and he was grieved in that they had received the circumcision, and that after that had been put to death. And in his blessings he took amiss upon us, for we sinned, because we have done this thing against his will, and he was sick on that day. Levi repented and put his offense to death. Here's Gad. Here's where his came from. Remember the story about the, about the lambs, you know, that he goes and tells his father about? Yosef told our father that the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah were slain the best of the flock and eating them against the judgment of Reuben and Yehuda. For he saw that I had delivered a lamb out of the mouth of a bear, and put the bear to death, but had slain the lamb, grieved concerning that it could not live, and that we had eaten it. And regarding this matter, I was wroth with Yosef until the day that he was sold. And the spirit of hatred was in me, and I wished not either to hear of Yosef with the ears or see him with the eyes, because he rebuked us to our faces, saying that we were eating of the flock without Yehuda, for whatsoever things he told our father, he believed him. So Yosef had not understood the whole story, and went and told him. He had this big offense, but Gad got over his offense, and he repented also. He says, I confess in all my sin, my children, that sometimes I wish to kill him, because I hated him from my heart. Moreover, I hated him yet more for his dreams. I wished him to lick the land of, out of the land of the living, just as an ox licks up the grass of the field. Therefore, I and Simeon sold him to the Ishmaelites for thirty pieces of gold, and ten of them we hid and showed the twenty-four to our brethren, etc. And says, Now my children hearken to the words of truth, to work righteousness and all the law of the Most High, and go not astray through the spirit of hatred, for it is evil in all the doings of men. And we have this again. He had an offense. His offense got put to death. The brothers searched their souls, let the Torah be alive in their hearts, confess their sin, and force their pride to remain in their family and dwell together in unity. Well, we have a blessing. We are going to have an opportunity really soon. All of us are. We can stay for one. We have this opportunity. It's made available. We can gather together in unity. If this opportunity is presented to us by Yeshua, the uh, it's Chaim, the tree of life, the living Torah. And we follow this Torah, and this Torah comes with us and keeps Shabbat a holy time. Um, you know, we are 
not made for Shabbat, but Shabbat's made for us. Something we have available on Shabbat in our rest is to meditate and remember who made us. So, there's a reminder for us, and again, I'm going to read this. It's from the sayings of our fathers. And talks about what we do when we sit to eat. It says, three who eat at one table and do not speak words of Torah, it is as if they have eaten of idolatrous sacrifices, as it is stated, indeed all tables are filled with the vomit and filth devoid of the omnipresent, that's Isaiah 28, 8. But three who eat at one table and speak words of Torah, it is as if they have eaten at God's table, as it is stated, and he said to me, this is the table that is before God. That's Ezekiel 41, 22. So, to Deodone, as you visit at the tables, remember Adonai. Taste and see that he's good. Psalm 34 says, how blessed are those who take refuge in him. And so we have it. Every one of us has been offended in an all likelihood we'll feel offended again. Some of you might feel offended right now. Um, and so first I want to invite you to look at the disciples' prayer, commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. This is, if you want to go and get a copy of that, you can go to Hebrew for Christians website under prayers. And, I don't know, you probably can't read that at all. Uh, most likely not the Hebrew, and I can barely see the English. But I'll read this for you as the disciples in the Hebrew meaning, because it reads, of course, top to bottom, right to left. And that doesn't look like, oh, there we are. It says, our Father, who is in heaven, sanctified your name. Let come your kingdom. Be done your will on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day the bread, our portion, and forgive us our offenses as forgiving we are to those who offend us. And do not lead us to the hands of temptation, but deliver us from evil. For to you the kingdom, and the power, and the beauty, forever and into the ages. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. If anyone would like to come up who's struggled with offenses, had, would like a prayer over that, or if you feel offended now and would like to talk about that, I'd like if the worship team could come up here and have some music and make the way easy for you and be blessed.